welcome back to Dishing with Patricia. This is my 10th episode. Time has just gone by. I hope you guys are ex as excited as I am about my podcast. My previous guests have come with all of their knowledge, talking about policies, talking about capital, venture capitalists. Um, I had a young lady that was a cancer survivor, but most important today, my guest is here to talk about the elderly. She's an advocate about what's going on in our society. So let me introduce you to Karen Buck. Karen, welcome to Dishing with Patricia. But most Karen is the executive director of the Senior Law Center here in Philadelphia. I welcome you to Dishing with Patricia. Such a pleasure to be here, Patricia. Thank you so much. Can you tell my audience exactly what the Senior Law Center does? Yes. So the Senior Law Center is a public interest nonprofit organization, and we advocate and seek justice for older Pennsylvanians. We are attorneys and advocates, and we're fighting elder abuse and financial exploitation, uh, poverty, homelessness, and helping grandparents raise grandchildren. That's a lot. It's a lot, and that's just a, a small capsule of what we do. Um, we serve about 10,000 older people each year, and um, we're really looking to promote in independence, dignity, autonomy for older people, for their families, for the thousands and thousands of grandchildren that they're raising in very heroic roles, and I know that's an issue that's near and dear to your heart. Yes, it so is. So I hope we can find some time to talk about that. Um, but really to lift up um, older people and raise their voices and give them a voice. Um, as they're going through, you know, the third chapter of their lives, we often call that. And as many, our clients, are going through poverty and really dark days of their lives. So tell me, since the pandemic, what specifically is going on with our seniors? So you know, and I'm sure your audience knows, that um, COVID-19 has disparately affected older people. They were the most likely to have infection, the most likely to have severe health consequences, and the most likely to die. And that was both in congregate settings like nursing homes um, and senior living, as well as in the community. So COVID and the pandemic has been brutal on the lives of older people. Um, so one thing we have been doing with our partners and leaders in Harrisburg and in Washington is really to advocate for access to, back in the day, right, last year, testing, access to vaccines, access to PPE, and all the safeguards and precautions to make sure that older people were safe and that their needs were being met. And that was especially dire in the nursing home situations. Do you find that they're more vulnerable now because they don't have access to their family? Yes, absolutely true, both in the long-term care settings and in the community where most older people do live in the community in their own homes, whether it's as homeowners or tenants renting. Um, it's been a very, very vulnerable time for folks. Um, as you can imagine, during the time when we were all quarantined and stay under stay-at-home orders, if you were facing eviction or foreclosure or the loss of your home and homelessness, it could mean you know severe illness and possibly death. So what we're seeing now is the problems that we're always addressing as lawyers and advocates for vulnerable yeah. older people is that much more severe during the pandemic. So has the mandate that they had about evictions, rental and things of that nature, has that kind of delayed them having to move out of their homes while you guys help them to be able to stay? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, Philadelphia and City Council um, have had really bright lights shining through the pandemic in terms of coming up with new emergency housing protections okay. for low-income um, renters especially. Um, but those national and city and state moratoriums on eviction are ending and foreclosure moratoriums are ending and has been a moving target, different things in Philadelphia versus other parts of Pennsylvania and in the rest of the country. So we really encourage 
your audience who has questions, particularly the older people, yeah. six, 60 and older, that's our age, and we know okay. it's really young today. We serve folks who are 60 well into their hundreds. They, to ask, tell them, call us if you have questions. Please give us your Go phone number. Go to our number. website and get more information. So can you give us your phone number and your website, please? Yes. So in Philadelphia, our phone number is 215-988-1242 for intake and 1244 for general information. Um, we also have a statewide helpline that's open to any older Pennsylvanians, okay. 60 and older, and that's 1-877-PASR-LAW. And then our website, which has <laughs> lots of information, both okay. on COVID, on resources, on legal issues, um, on um, you know FAQs, uh, a real wealth of information on all our projects and services, and we have many, many. And that is www.seniorlawcenter.org. So if someone called you and t mentioned to you that they had an issue, they had a problem, and they left a message, and you guys returned the call. How do you identify that this is your, that you guys are actually calling them? Because we recognize there are a lot of scams going on. How would they, how is it that they would be able to identify that it's actually you? And do you have a one-on-one? -on -one? So what is actually, tell me just like step by step, what would happen if I called and say, Karen, I'm having issues, I'm being put out tomorrow. Can you help me? because of the fact that I have a senior aunt and she's always calling me. They called me and said, my social security check is being taken. I said, social security is not going to call you on the phone. That's right. And those kinds of scams and fraud and financial exploitation are a national crisis and a citywide and statewide crisis. So that is an area that we handle um, robustly with a whole team, 20 attorneys and advocates, um, all kinds of elder abuse. But to answer your question, most, most people are not calling um, fraudulently to get free legal services, yeah. but we do go through a whole intake process. So if you were to call or your aunt or um, a loved one, um, they would leave a message and then we have a process of callbacks where if it's an emergency, which we have very clearly defined, you're losing your home, you're being right. abused or exploited, et cetera, um, time-sensitive, urgent issues, you'll be called back within 24 hours. Um, most people are not facing emergencies, but things that are a real problem, but they're not life or death at the time. Um, and so there's a, a couple day callback time frame for folks, usually a maximum of three days. But we try to respond to folks as soon as possible in the order in which they've called. They will be contacted, a whole intake process is done. And then as needed, if it's a legal issue, they will have an appointment by phone with an attorney um, mm -hmm. to talk through their problem. If we can advise them and guide them through their problem by phone, which we can with many people, answer right. their questions, talk right. about their rights, then we can um, provide those services and be done. If they need additional help, like going to court, like executing documents, et cetera, something much more complex, then we will intake them, provided they meet our priorities and eligibility, which I can talk about, and then put them um, on our uh, case list for further representation. Okay, so what is the criteria for someone to ha be intake into the law center? Because we know that seniors are having a difficult time across the board, not just they're not, they don't make a lot of money, their medications are taking up a lot of their social security, and as you said, housing, and a lot of them are alone, and they're not very, tr they don't trust a lot of people. So what is it, what is the income that a senior has to so, be able to make, or whatever your guidelines are? Yes, so I should mention all of our services are free, oh, great. which is beautiful, that's, that's right? <laughs> Nonprofit, um, and so, Anyone of any income can call us for free legal advice, counseling, and legal information. And that is a, a big piece of what we can provide 
anyone despite income. And I would say that a majority of folks who call us, that is what they need. Okay. Um, for those to come into the fold to actually have ex what we call extended legal representation, you're a grandparent raising a grandchild, you have a family court hearing, we're going to go with you to that hearing and guide you through that complex legal system. Um, you have to be 60 and older and a resident of Philadelphia. Um, and then we don't have strict income cutoffs. I would say that the majority of folks that we serve are living at about 150% or less of poverty. But we, as you just said, recognize that there's a whole universe of vulnerabilities. Yes. I live alone. I'm isolated. I don't speak English well. Um, I'm very, you know, I have, I have disabilities. I'm homebound. I'm bedbound. I mean, there's so many different vulnerabilities. So we take the whole person in and look at their needs and try to serve as many people as possible. That's great. What can we do that can help our seniors today as a society? What can we do? Because we know that seniors are part of our hidden society. As you just said, they're alone. A lot of them are homeless or they don't have any family members. What can we do to help them at this time because they are very, very vulnerable. Yeah. What is what would you suggest? And I appreciate that question very much. So I do, I did want to say at the outset that um, when we're when we turn sixty, and many of us are very close or have hit that milestone, mm -hmm. we don't suddenly become um, you know super vulnerable and voiceless. And people at all steps of their lives can have vulnerabilities. So we want folks to recognize that seniors and older people are diverse um, just as we all are. They come in every race, color, creed, language, but also sophistication level, education level, um, abilities. So we first and foremost, we ask folks, do not be ageist, paternalistic, and treat older people as children. They are adults with rich lives and experiences. So that's number one. Um, number two is recognize that folks are facing challenges and may need our help to get them to the services that they need. Um, and we have huge senior poverty in Philadelphia. Uh, about 25% of older people in Philadelphia are living at or well below the poverty line and more so one in two, almost 50% are living near poverty. So that is a huge number nationally, and it's a huge issue that our leaders and our government decision makers um, and all of us should be taking into account. So check in on folks in your neighborhood. See if they're isolated or need social supports. If you see something, say something. Help them get to the help that they may need. Um, you mentioned financial exploitation, scams, fraud, a huge issue for folks, not just for the financial piece, but for their lives. And it can be extraordinarily devastating for folks. So be compassionate, um, be aware, um, and you know, help them get through what might be hard times. Um, but first and foremost, I would say, treat everyone as an individual and recognize that at all stages of their lives, people deserve respect, independence, and autonomy. We support a nonprofit that is grandparents raising their grandchildren. That is a, that's a, that's a huge issue. It is a huge issue. And um, in Pennsylvania alone, there's over 100,000 children who are being raised by grandparents. And we know that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's what we know of. Um, and so these are heroic men and women who are standing up, um, standing in the void, in the gap, at a time when their children and their family are at risk. Risk of going into foster care, risk of being abandoned or neglected, risk at um, not, not having birth parents who can care for them. So it's a really proud area of law that we handle. We've been doing it for decades, 
but it's especially vital now because of the opioid crisis, because of skyrocketing um, numbers of incarceration, of mental health, of illness, COVID. Um, even military deployment can cause this type of kinship care need. So we help those grandparents, great-grandparents, and other older people who are raising young children through that really challenging time. I mean, it's hard to be a parent at any age. So okay. then imagine doing it as you're an older person. And, you know, it's not just socially important and amazing that they do this. Um, really helping those kids flourish in loving right. homes of parents and grandparents. It also has a huge economic impact. Um, and the Secretary of Aging in Pennsylvania has estimated that grandparents raising grandchildren have saved and will save the Commonwealth over $1 billion a year. Wow, so is there a system that the grandparents get some type of assistance to help raise these children. Yes, they can. Okay. And it all depends what system you're in. Okay, so if you're in the child welfare system versus outside, and we understand that a lot of people want to stay outside the child welfare system. But again, we encourage folks to call us. We have a special project for grandparents raising grandchildren, okay. um, a team that works here in Philadelphia, as well as in Harrisburg and Pittsburgh. And again, our helpline is open to any older person in any of our 67 counties. Call us and get more information, get your questions answered, and know what your rights are as a grandparent. So I'm just going through the, let's say, the, the index of the Senior Law Center. So we've touched on that. But homelessness, has the pandemic and the opioid crisis change that picture for seniors? Just 60 is young to be a senior, yeah. but there's been an increase. I see it because I walk, and I noticed a shift that they're not all seniors. There are a lot of young people. So has the, this pandemic, is it causing people to be homeless? Is it because of at substance abuse or issues with housing that they're now having to address that they no longer have a home? Right. Well, I would say housing is perhaps the number one legal issue and the crisis that we're really focused on right now. We have many crises. We've talked about some of them, many of them. But losing your home affects every aspect of your life, as we all know, yes. right? Um, and when you're older, it becomes that much more um, just critical to your life, to your access to health care, to your access to your church or house of worship, to your support system, to your family, to, you know, the things that you know and rely on. Um, the eviction moratoriums and the foreclosure moratoriums have been just so important in helping to prevent homelessness, but they are ending. Foreclosures will start at the end of this month and foreclosure court will open, reopen. Evictions have started again in Philadelphia and before that, well across other parts of the state and the nation. Um, so those moratoriums have been essential preventions, but now they're ending. Um, there still is rental assistance to help folks who are behind in their rent. And you mentioned all ages. You see many more folks who are uh, homeless or at imminent risk of homelessness. People have lost jobs. People have lost familial income. Um, there's been sickness. There's been death. So yes, families are still really in crisis and older people are still in crisis. So what do you do about that? Is there a lack of, I mean, units, I mean, housing? Is there a shortage that there's not enough housing for the seniors to transition some of them that may still have some income, but they can no longer afford maybe $2,000 a month, but you can afford $1,000 or 1500 Is there is there some type of transitional place that they can go or what is going on that's going to bridge that gap? Yeah. First of all, you hit the nail right on the head. There is an enormous lack of adequate low-income housing in our city. Um, it's been identified as, as an urgent need. Um, so we know that there's a huge lack of affordable housing generally for low-income communities. There are waiting lists 
um, for low-income affordable housing. And then there is a paucity of senior housing available. So there are long waiting lists for folks, particularly to get into subsidized housing. So the, there's just inadequate supply, and the city knows that, and there's actually some hearings coming up in city council. So what council. are they going to do about that? I can't answer for city council, no, no, I but I certainly it. hope that they will, uh, and President Biden has recognized this. He has said that developing new units of affordable, low-income housing is one of his priorities, particularly for older people, and he gets that. Um, you've also, though, asked the question about is there an interim, and I just would point out like, we have older homeowners, which is the majority of older people, even if you're low income in Philadelphia. You can be poor and still own a home, and you see that driving around our, our city. Um, but it's the cost, the increasing cost of taxes, of home repair, of, of everything that you need that we all know to keep up a house that gets that much more um, challenging when you get older. And also, you're living on a low uh, fixed income. income. You're not able to go out and increase your income. You're probably not able to go out and get a job. Um, and jobs are, are that much harder now during COVID. Um, but homeowners are facing a, a slew of issues. And now that foreclosure is coming back um, into play, um, we are very, very concerned about there being a real humanitarian crisis in our city of homelessness of older people, of disabled people, of children, of families, and there needs to be urgent steps taken. There is very little homelessness, uh, shelter housing available, transitional housing, very little. Um, so the city has recognized it as a crisis and we hope that they will respond. Just yesterday I was on a call with um, some really wonderful new champions in the city council and their teams and other partners and advocates talking about these hearings that we're going to hold upcoming about the challenges of senior tenants and the eviction crisis and what can we do to make sure that our grandparents, parents, great-grandparents are not homeless in their older years. That's sure. just not acceptable in this country or this city. Well, dishing with Patricia, part of this is about food, how our food is our medicine. Older people are on a lot of medicine. Their prescriptions. We know that there are food deserts that's throughout most cities in the U.S. How can we help bridge that gap? Because if you're paying for your rent, you're paying for your medication, what, if, what is being done about helping them to be able to eat healthy? It's a great question, and um, senior hunger is a real issue yeah. in this country and in this city. And isn't that a horrible thing to say? Yes, it that is. That we don't have enough food in this country to make sure that older people and children, all of us, but particularly at those ends of the life cycle, have adequate food and nutrition. Um, so we work very closely with Philadelphia Corporation for Aging, which is one of our partners, um, and, and they are very much focused on senior hunger um, and uh, increasing resources for that. Of course, there are Meals on Wheels, Phil Abundance, and Aid for Friends. So we have a number of partners who are really trying to step up to that void. But it is a huge issue. Again, I say that leaders of our city need to do more for our older people. It's not been a priority of the city, and I would like to see it more of a priority. The other thing I would say is I mentioned that 50% of older Philadelphians are living at or near poverty, at 200% or less of our national poverty level. And research has shown that at that income, seniors cannot afford one of basic basic human needs, and that could be food, housing, or medicine. So we know the hunger issue continues to be a major problem. And because of the pandemic, they couldn't go out. They couldn't get what they needed exactly. here in shelter. So I would talk a little bit about voting rights if I can. No, I'm you? coming to that next, <laughs> that that is a huge issue that is going on. Um, they're having issues with younger people registering to vote, older people being able to get out to vote. I know myself that in the system that they mail you, I mailed you your card, what happened? 
I, I didn't get it. Your signature changed, so that's not who you are. When you're 60, your signature doesn't look like it does when you were 40. So tell me, what's going on with that? So voting rights is one of the areas of real um, urgency um, and an area of advocacy that we've been working on, a real passion of mine in particular. So um, you'll remember a few years back, um, there was a push for voter ID yes. in our state and across the country. And we were very involved in helping to fight back against that um, because of the disenfranchisement of hundreds of thousands of folks at all ages. You mentioned young people, um, disabled people, older people, um, and particularly persons of color, uh, black and brown communities. Um, and it affected older people so significantly because they simply didn't have the photo ID, government issued photo ID to show to vote. And, and many could never get it. So we have made huge strides in Pennsylvania on modernizing the election system. We have now um, no excuse absentee ballots. You can mail, you can vote by mail. Yeah. I mean, the most amazing progress after many years of um, really conservative laws on voting. But now the pendulum is swinging. We saw how important it was for that modernization to increase access to the most fundamental right of being an American citizen. Um, and now we see new attacks on the right to vote, trying to go back to the old ways. And that is incredibly disturbing to us, um, not just for older people, um, but for low income people, for youth, all the folks that we mentioned, for all of us, yes. for all of us, especially during the pandemic, which is still real and still happening and still a crisis for our community. So we are working with advocates across the state to try to maintain the excellent progress we have made to protect the right to vote and to fight um, the new brewing of voter ID and other steps to disenfranchise voters. We should make it easier yes, to vote I for agree. everyone, not put obstacles in the way of voters. If you're homeless, how do you vote? It's very difficult um, to vote when you're homeless, but you still have the right to vote um, because you don't have a permanent address, et cetera. Um, so if you, you still should be able to vote in your current district. Um, but again, if folks have questions, um, often voting is not the priority of folks who are uh, homeless um, because they have to deal with so many other emergencies. Sure. Um, but we want everyone, including folks who are homeless, imminently homeless, to have the right to vote. Project Home has an enormous, enormously successful voting rights initiative. And so they are great partners in this and a great resource for homeless communities to find out about voting. If you're a grandparent and you want to be a foster parent to some children, what, what can you do? How do you go about that? Because we know that foster care, there are a lot of children that need a home. And some elderly people would welcome that. As a matter of fact, that would give them new life. How do we do, how can we find out about that? Because it's, it's, it's a lot of children that need a home and some elderly people need that too. That would give them new life. So I'm so glad you brought that up because you know this is an issue near and dear to my heart. Um, I was a foster parent and then adopted my, my son through foster care. Um, there are half a million children in foster care today looking for a home um, across the country. And so I would encourage everyone to think about opening their home to a foster child. Um, these are kids who need us and we can do more. So folks who are interested in foster care can contact uh, you know, their child welfare agency, DHS, in Philadelphia. And then there's an um, array of agencies, social service agencies, which will walk you through or give you more information, answer your preliminary questions, and then um, connect you with resources to walk you through that process. Um, there is a process to becoming a foster parent, which there should be because sure. you're taking on a big responsibility. But um, I would just say from my personal perspective, 
It is a joyful process. It is a joyful experience to bring a child into your home through that system. There's also foster grandparents, at least uh, out of the foster care system, sure. uh, folks who serve in that role in a more casual way for kids who, um, who are in need of more supports and mentors in their lives. Um, and so there's more information on that as well through DHS and other agencies. Before we go to my, our cooking segment of um, Dishing with Patricia, is there something that we didn't address that you would definitely want our audience to know about the Senior Law Center? We've covered homelessness, we've covered um, rent and um, mortgage issues being evict evicted. So is there something that I didn't cover that's really important because we, I think seniors are, are invisible people in our society. So how can we bring them to the forefront? Because we have to respect, they bring a lot of knowledge. They have a lot to contribute to our society. And as you just said, there are a lot of foster children that, could, that would bring a lot of hope. So tell me, is there something that we didn't cover that's important that you feel that I want your people to know? Right. So one thing I would mention, Patricia, um, is to kind of debunk the myth that everyone who's facing a problem, like the problems we've talked about, has a right to an attorney. So in, uh, in criminal court, if you're arrested or at risk of that, you have the right to an appointed counsel. Okay, we all know that from our TV shows, yes. et cetera. <laughs> However, in the civil justice system, I'm losing my home, I'm losing my kids, I'm facing domestic violence, um, I'm, I've lost my income, my health care, et cetera. Really basic human needs. There is no civil right to counsel in any no. of those areas. So you, if you have resources, you can, yes, of course, hire an attorney. I'm an attorney. There's plenty of private attorneys out there. But low-income people, by and large, cannot hire private counsel. And that's where we come in as civil legal aid. We are here to provide an attorney and access to the justice system for those who can't afford private counsel. Because having an attorney through these complex legal issues makes all the of difference in terms of your positive outcomes, in terms of understanding the system. You know, we wouldn't treat ourselves as doctors. Um, we shouldn't have to, or low-income people should not have to navigate a complex legal system on their own. Um, without the training, without the experience, et cetera, they should have attorneys just as the tenants of the landlords of the world, the banks of the world, and all the other folks in the world who are bringing lawsuits against individuals have. So we believe strongly in promoting a civil right to counsel in these areas of basic human need, and we are advocating for that um, locally, regionally, and nationally. But I want people to understand that's why we exist, because there is no automatic right to have a lawyer when you're, even when you're facing these areas of basic human need. Um, so we encourage people to come to our website, um, call us, particularly if you're a senior, um, our general rule is that we must speak with the senior, him or herself, um, and that's important for us to form an attorney-client relationship. And also, for your viewers, you know, join us in this work. Lift up the lives of older people who have contributed so much to this country. Um, you know, they were the original advocates for voting rights, for civil rights, for equality, for LGBT rights. You know, they were on those front lines at Selma um, and marching and, you know, really changed and built this country. So join us in this work. We have opportunities to volunteer, both as an attorney, not as an attorney. We have board opportunities. And of course, we have giving opportunities. I was going to say, how how can we donate to the, to the senior lawsuit? I'm so glad you asked me that question. So as I mentioned, we're serving about 10,000 individuals every year, and we always have a waiting list. We're getting about two to 300 requests for assistance every week. And it's tax deductible. It is tax deductible. Yes, we are a nonprofit organization. Um, we are well run. We are lean and mean. Every dollar is important to us and made used to the greatest extent possible. And they can go to our website. There's a donate button right there. 
any amount is appreciated. And again, um, we will maximize that investment. I am so happy that you came because elderly people, it's important that we take care of our people. Um, my husband and I believe that part of our journey on this planet, in this world, and why we exist as a people, that we should give back. We have to help those that are less deserved, that don't have, we're fortunate, all of us are fortunate. We're here today, we're not concerned about what we're going to eat, we're not concerned about where, where we're going to stay tonight, but we need to go back and see those people. Seniors should not be in the positions that they are in. I absolutely agree with you and I applaud you and your husband's generosity. It is why I left private practice in the law firm world and have spent the last 25 years in public interest law. Um, we believe in service, we believe in lifting people up, we believe in helping them be their own voice and raise their voice and we believe in justice. And um, I hope that your viewers will see the older people in their lives and recognize that aging is a universal condition. Yes, it's going it to happen. It's not just them. <laughs> we are all going there. And I would say, like as we conclude, aging is seen as, you know, oh, a horrible time in our lives. I don't want to get old. I don't want to get wrinkly. I don't want to get there. But aging is a gift. Yes. Um, it's a gift to age ourselves, to live long lives. Um, and to have our families um, age with us. And to my parents are both uh, approaching 90, and it is a blessing to have them. And yes. I honor them, and I respect them, uh, as we do all of our clients. Give us a couple of minutes, and we'll be back. Hi, folks. Welcome back. I've been drinking this wonderful apple tea. This is really good. Apples are in an abundance. This is fall. Go out, get some apples. It's, it is really true. An apple a day will keep the doctor away. It will also help you with controlling your diabetes, your high cholesterol. I've often said to you that eating healthy will assist you in all of your chronic diseases. Food is our medicine. Let's take advantage of it. So I'm gonna take advantage of this moment right now and I'm going to make you a gluten-free apple and pear tart. These are Granny Smith apples. These are Bartlett pears. Once again, this is the fall. They're in abundance. So let, let me get started and I'm gonna just mix this together. All my ingredients, the nutritional value can be found on classyandessentialnutrition.com. Look on my website, send me a note, give me some suggestions, tell me some things that you possibly want to know about. Well, what do I do if I do this? So I'm going to tell you what I did today. I typically make my own crust for my pies, my cakes. I didn't have an opportunity to do that. So what you need to do, use what you have in your fridge. This is pizza dough. Yep, pizza dough. It's really, really good. So let me get started. I'm going to mix. These are my pears. The ingredients, don't forget, is on my website. Those are the apples. This is my cornstarch, which is going to help with the consistency. It's going to help thicken it. This is brown sugar. A little bit of salt. I think I told you guys about that time that I made some muffins. I forgot the salt. It was terrible. They were really bad. I tried to get away with it. They looked really cute. I asked my brother, I said, how do they taste? He was like, what did you forget? You forgot something. So just mix this together. These are apples and these are pears and the combination of it. We're just going to mix it together. So I'm going to sit this over here and this is the um, pizza dough. 
So you just take one apple, one pear. It's going to take you a minute, but it's going to look really, really cute, I promise. And it's, you don't have to be real neat about it when you're done. So for time's sake, I've um, already done one. Here it is. Look at that. Doesn't that look good? You don't have to use apples or pears. Use anything that you have in the fridge, the fruit. But remember, you need some type of um, binder. The cornstarch will do that for you. Look at this. Isn't this gorgeous? And why it looks so nice around the rim of the crust is I used vegan butter and some cinnamon. This is the time of year, Thanksgiving. Just think if you brought this over to the family. They're like, you made that? Yeah, I made this. You could do this with sweet potatoes. Experiment. I always tell you guys that I never follow a recipe. Make it your own. But most importantly, the holidays are coming. We want to see our family. We want to see our friends get vaccinated. Wear a mask. Think about our seniors. They're lonely. Some of them are lonely. Some of them don't have enough food. Think about them. I try to treat, treat people how I want to be treated. So think about our elderly people during these holidays. Give them a call. Invite them over. Treat your family and your friends the way you want to be treated. So give us a moment. I'll be right back with my guest, Karen. And um, I'll see you in a few. Welcome back. My first dish that I'm going to make for you is a garlic butter mushroom cauliflower dish. So I'm using portobello mushrooms. I'm having, so, oh, this is my shiitake, I'm sorry. And these are baby portobellos. So what I want you to do first is get the butter started. So while I'm cutting up everything else, the butter will already start. And um, always, before you include um, food into, a, into a, um, a, a, a pan, you should already have the oil starting to warm up. Don't put your food into a cold pan. The oil is cold. The butter is cold. You want to start the cooking process immediately. So I've got my burner on, and it's going to start up. And before we know it, we're going to move on. But I'm going to just slice some of these portobello mushrooms and shiitake mushrooms. You know, mushrooms have a lot of nutritional value. And as I've been saying to you, you could see um, on my website, classyandessentialnutrition.com, all of my recipes that are featured here on Dishing with Patricia are on my website. As we start to move into fall, it's now time for us to start thinking about what type of fruits and vegetables that we're going to eat. Um, a lot of the root vegetables are fall vegetables, so I want you to think about that. I wonder why this, oh, start. You should always push start. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so the butter is going to be going, but while I'm waiting on the butter, um, Karen is going to join me um, shortly. Um, I would want to thank her so much for all of the information that she was giving us about the Senior Law Center, it's important that we consider our senior citizens. They're our history. We're our future and our current lives that are going, what's going on in our current lives is based on what we have learned from people in our lives. So it's important that we don't make them invisible. That's not good, how we treat our elderly in the United States, that is. So I'm just going to add some onions. Get the onions started. You want them to get translucent and, you know, soft. You don't want them to get too overly cooked where they're mushy. I want you to add the mushrooms. This dish can also be roasted. You don't have to 
put it on top of a stove. As a matter of fact, I would have preferred that I had roasted this, but I did um, in the end just top it off in the oven in the end. Add your olive oil. Here is some garlic. This is some vegetable stock. Here is some white wine. If this was a glass, I would sip it before I put it in this um, dish here. If it was a wine glass. So you wanna cook this. Um, the white wine will reduce. For time's sake, I'm going to take this dish out of the oven. I've already made it, but as you can see, this, is, this won't take very long, but just give me a second. Look at this. Look at the cauliflower. Look at the mushrooms. This is going to be so good. I would serve this with a nice crusty bread, a glass of wine. This is not a side dish. This is a major, this is your entree. It has onions, it has mushrooms. Once you get your slice of bread, a glass of wine, Bon Appetit. You can find this recipe on dishingwithpatricia.com. So let me get you a plate. I hope you're going to like this. It looks delicious yes. and healthy. Yes, I believe in that. I believe that all foods that you are taking in should be healthy because food is our medicine, particularly in this time that we're going in. We need to stay healthy for our families, for our friends, and food is the connector. Absolutely. Yes. So please taste this and Thank let me you. know what you think. I'm so excited. There you go. Appreciate that. Oh, delicious. You like it? Yeah, so I can't wait to make this at home. Well, as I said, you can find this recipe and nutritional um, content on classy and essential nutrition.com. Thank you.